I have decided to be the uh, master of the ceremony for the evening myself. Uh, typically, this is not the case. Uh, typically, uh, the events are uh, sort of compared by someone else. Uh, but as you know, uh, my favorite singer is uh, Kishore Kumar uh, from the Hindi film songs. And uh, he used to announce his own shows uh, with a song. Uh, if, if some of you have seen it on YouTube, it starts off with Mere Nana Nani Ho, Mere Mama Mami Ho. So I, decided, I, I took inspiration from him and decided uh, I won't sing for you today, but uh, I thought I'll just uh, be the master of the ceremony myself. Uh, but there are two uh, reasons why I made that decision. Uh, first, because uh, as uh, recommended by my wife, Manjiri, uh, the book is uh, dedicated to one of my school teachers, uh, Shailesh Shah, sir, uh, who unfortunately passed away about uh, two and a half years back. And uh, this is uh, both uh, in his memory as well as uh, in gratitude for his, uh, his priceless mentoring uh, that he provided. I call it priceless because he did not charge me a single rupee for all the coaching, private coaching that he provided uh, to me. Uh, uh, he, he has been a very important part of my journey uh, right from the early days. And so I wanted to dedicate uh, the book to him and uh, uh, and start off with that. Uh, second, I also wanted to mention uh, here that, uh, uh, you know, as we are in the midst of COVID, a lot of difficult challenges are being faced by everyone. Uh, the focus everywhere is on uh, uh, often on economics. Uh, but continuing with this theme of education and dedication to my school teacher, uh, I wanted to mention here also the work uh, that is being done on the ground to continue to provide education to underprivileged children, skilling uh, to those who are not in jobs right now in different parts of the country. Uh, I have been associated with an NGO in India called Pratham, uh, whose goal is to have every child in school and learning well. Uh, Pratham uh, uh, reaches out every year to over 5 million uh, children and 30,000 youth uh, through vocational training and pre-primary and primary education. And even in the midst of COVID, uh, Pratham has been trying to provide digital content uh, all over the country, working with over 12,000 communities uh, directly uh, and in partnership with 14 states uh, and over 250 NGOs. Uh, in fact, it's remarkable that they already had digital content prepared uh, and they were also uh, ready to deliver it to all kinds of medium uh, mediums, uh, including actually radio. Uh, because in many parts of India, we can't just use smartphones even today and just send over this content. Uh, I'm mentioning this in particular because uh, at least my share of the proceeds uh, from the book are uh, all going to be donated uh, to Pratham. But regardless of whether you buy the book or not, uh, I encourage all of you to see if you can find some space in your respective budgets. Uh, and accommodate it if you can't maybe introduce uh, Pratham and other excellent NGOs doing work on children's education in India. I think uh, it's a very important long run goal and I wanted to mention this as another dedication uh, of the book. Some housekeeping announcements uh, before we take off. Uh, on Firstly, uh, I see that people are still signing in. So for those of you who have signed in late, uh, I want to wish uh, all of you a very good evening and welcome on behalf of Sage Publications India uh, and the author of the book, uh, that's me. Um, a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, please uh, kindly ensure that your cameras and microphones are turned off unless uh, you are uh, the uh, part participant. Um, uh, second, uh, there will be a Q question and answer session at the end. Uh, feel free to submit your questions in the chat window and Manisha Matthews from uh, Sage India will curate the questions. Uh, uh, and lastly, uh, Sage has asked me to uh, men uh, mention to all of you that 
The book is available right now at 20% off on the Sage website at stealadeal.sagepub.in. Uh, there's an additional 10% discount if you create an account, and the book is also available on Amazon at a 10% discount. So uh, with all that uh, shameless marketing for the book as the compare for the evening, uh, let me now uh, turn to the main proceedings uh, for the day. Uh, we are going to start off with uh, someone whom I consider uh, my guru as far as central banking is concerned. Uh, he is not uh, someone uh, whom uh, all of you don't know. Uh, in fact, many of you who are signed in know him in much closer capacity uh, professionally than I do. Uh, but I've had the pleasure, privilege and fortune of interacting with him for his guidance and blessings uh, all through my stint as a central banker. Uh, he's no other than Dr. Y. V. Reddy, a former chairman, 14th Finance Commission and former governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, he was uh, kind enough both to first uh, encourage, inspire and give me the idea to bind together the speeches, uh, but also to write a masterful forward. Uh, as you know, one of the core themes in the book is uh, fiscal dominance and how that affects financial stability. And uh, Dr. Reddy's forward actually does a far uh, more emphatic uh, job of driving this point home than my introductory chapter does. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for agreeing to be with us this evening. And I would like to request you to say a few words as a formal way of electronically inaugurating uh, the book. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dear friends, and it so happens many of the people who have joined this session are really my good friends. I'm thankful to Sage Publications and Dr. Verra Acharya for inviting me to this event and giving me the honor. I have expressed my opinion on the subject, the author, and the book in the foreword. So, briefly, let me read out two sentences from the foreword. Dr. Acharya's passion for making a difference in the monetary and regulatory history of Reserve Bank of India comes across through the pages of the book. Unquote. He has produced a unique book that is informative, analytical, contextual, and without doubt, a lasting contribution. I must add at this stage that the book should be of equal interest to students, scholars, policy makers and market participants because of the way in which the subjects are presented. The issues related to financial stability in India have become more complex now and more challenging now since the speeches were delivered. In addition, the spread of virus has imparted more complications and greater urgency to address the problem of financial stability in the face of unprecedented, humongous fiscal challenges. In this background, the book is of special and urgent contemporary interest. We are fortunate to have Dr. Gabur Subaragaru to deliver the keynote address, and we also have undoubtedly very distinguished panelists. I join you and look forward to an enlightening discussion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, sir, once again for uh, inaugurating the event. Uh, I encourage all of you to uh, read uh, Dr. Reddy's uh, truly uh, insightful forward, uh, which gives not just the present context, but also a very long historical journey uh, of how India's financial sector, banking sector, the government involvement in the banking sector and the regulations have evolved over a period of time. Uh, and why, as India is becoming more and more a privatized and a market-based economy, uh, we need to look at revisiting uh, these relationships, uh, a, a theme that's uh, running all through the book. Uh, let me now uh, take the opportunity to welcome uh, Dr. Duhuri Subarao, 
Uh, as all of you know, he's not just a former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, but was also a finance secretary for uh, the government of India prior to that. Uh, Dr. Subarrao has kindly agreed uh, to deliver the keynote remarks. Uh, these remarks uh, will be available uh, for uh, reading for all of you and others uh, after the event. Uh, they are embargoed as of now, but they will be available uh, uh, for all of you to read uh, thereafter. Uh, thank you, sir, for agreeing to uh, speak today. Uh, let me hand it over to you. Uh, Dr. Subhadrao will also join the panel uh, to be chaired by Dr. Tamil Bandyopadhyay after his remarks. Uh, so you may please reserve your questions uh, for the chat in the chat session uh, for the panel for Dr. Subhadrao thereafter. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Viral, and good evening. First of all, my congratulations to Professor Viral Acharya for this book, which is certain to be a definitive contribution to understanding India's macroeconomic challenges. Speech making has now become a standard item on a central banker's job chart. Central bankers routinely speak to inform, interpret, and explain their policies. It wasn't always like this. Central bankers are known for deliberate incoherence. Alan Greenspan, the formidable former chairman of the Federal Reserve, folklore has it that he proposed to his future wife seven times before she understood that he was actually proposing to her. <laughs> Ten years into his tenure, Greenspan also told an audience famously that if you think you understood me, you probably misunderstood. Today's reality, however, is quite different. Central bankers routinely use speeches to advance their policy agenda. In the Reserve Bank of India, we had speeches by legendary governors, such as Dr. Rangarajan, Dr. Vaivi Reddy, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, whose speeches have influenced the course of our economic history. Even in such a crowded intellectual field, this book by Dr. Viral Acharya will stand out for many reasons. I just want to cite three. The first reason I commend Viral Acharya's book is for a clear enunciation of its central thesis, which he calls the theory of everything, which is that our government's short-term compulsions have consistently distorted economic policy priorities compromised our long-term sustainability and undermined, eventually, public welfare. Most writers stop there. They just define the problem and move on. That's escapist. Not with Alacharya, though. He goes on to define a blueprint, an action plan, very well articulated, very well reasoned. The intellectual rigor with which he does so is the first reason I commend this book. The second reason I commend this book is for the conviction and concern with which he communicates the frontline battles of a policy maker to influence economic policy debates. The earnestness with which he does so is both endearing and compelling. The third reason I commend this book is for the humility and integrity with which Viral Acharya communicates his thoughts and concerns, which capture both his frustration about what has been and his hope for what can be. This book straddles virtually all the major policy issues that are on the domain today. I want to address just three of them. One issue on which I agree with Professor Viral Acharya. One issue, one issue on which I will not say I disagree with him, but where I have a different perspective. And one issue where I want to extend his commentary. So let me move on. The first issue is whether the RBI should finance the government's deficit directly. In his book, Dr. Acharya comes out very clearly against direct financing of, mon of direct monetization of government's deficit by the Reserve Bank, unless it's done for inflation management. I agree with Dr. Acharya's position. 
Although he makes the point in a general context, I want to talk about it in today's crisis context. Whether the Reserve Bank of India should directly monetize the government's deficit has been speculated upon for some months now. The finance minister a few months ago said that she's keeping her options open. Many analysts and economists have weighed in on the issue, saying that direct financing of the deficit, direct monetization will be par for the cost in an extraordinary crisis like this. I believe direct financing should be absolutely the last resort, and here is my argument. The case for direct financing is made on the argument that the government has a huge borrowing program this year. In the economy, there's just not enough savings to finance such a huge debt offering. Yields will spike so high that financial stability will be threatened. Therefore, the government, excuse me, the, the RBI must directly finance government deficit. But there's no evidence to believe that we are anywhere close to that situation. The government is today able to borrow at near zero real rate of interest. The Reserve Bank of India has done such an extraordinary amount of in liquidity injection that bond yields are soft and they're getting softer. In spite of this clear evidence that the market feels quite comfortable, about financing the government's debt. Some economists assert that direct monetization should be taken to cost them. Their argument is that the Reserve Bank is already doing open market operations. That is indirect monetization. That involves printing of money. That is inflationary as well. Therefore, this not doing direct monetization is just a fig leaf. Why, just not, why not just do direct monetization? I believe that argument misses an important point. For sure, OMOs involve printing of money. OMOs are inflationary. But the inflation risk they carry is different. When the Reserve Bank does open market operations, it's in the driver's seat. Open market operations are a regular liquidity instrument of the Reserve Bank. RBI decides how much liquidity to inject, when and how. On the other hand, in the case of direct monetization, it's the government's borrowing program which determines how much monetization and when. If in spite of all this, the government decides to cross the Rubicon and the Reserve Bank of India decides to finance the government's deficit directly. The markets will perceive that the government is abandoning all fiscal constraints. It's trying to inflate away its debt. If that happens, bond yields will shoot up, just the opposite of what is sought to be achieved. For sure, there might be some time in the future when direct monetization might be the only option. That will be the case if yields by, so shoot up so high that the government finance cannot finance its debt at a reasonable rate. But we are not there yet. The second issue I want to address is inflation targeting. Dr. Viral Acharya endorses the inflation targeting framework. He also argues that contrary to the popular perception that the inflation targeting framework does not take into account financial stability concerns. He argues that it does take into account financial stability concerns. It factors in financial stability concerns. Dr. Acharya is not alone in endorsing inflation targeting framework. Many analysts, many economists attribute the relative price stability in India enjoyed since 2016 to the inflation targeting framework. So where do I differ from this general view? While I believe that the inflation targeting framework has served our economy well, I will stop short of an unqualified endorsement of this framework. What is the basis for my saying that? Note that in the four years since we've embarked on the inflation targeting framework, 
we've had a fairly benign inflation situation. On the domestic front, demand for private credit has been low because of the NPS or for whatever other reason. Therefore, there's been no demand push inflation. On the global front, there have been no hiccups on the financial stability front until six months ago when we were hit by the corona crisis. But even after we were hit by the corona crisis, our world turned topsy-turvy. Many issues came up front, but inflation is not one of them. So I believe that our inflation targeting framework has not been fully tested. I will endorse it fully only after our inflation targeting framework goes through a severe stress test. While I'm on the topic of inflation, of inflation targeting, just another thought. The inflation targeting framework is up for review next year. I believe that a lot of work has to be done in preparation for that review. In particular, in particular, a lot of research has to be done. I just want to point out four issues on which further research will be necessary. The first issue is the impact of the repo rate on inflation. There's not been much research done on this topic. And to the extent research exists, the conclusions are not definite. On the other hand, we're still having uh, monetary policy transmission problems. So the RBI, I believe, should commission both in-house and external research on the link between the repo rate and inflation. The second topic on which we need deeper research is the impact of the inflation targeting framework on inflation expectations. We know that inflation is self-fulfilling. In other words, if we expect high inflation, high inflation will materialize. RBI surveys routinely show that inflation expectations are high. Why is this the case? Is it the case that past episodes of inflation are having a hysteresis effect? Why has the inflation targeting framework, which has kept inflation low and steady, not subdued inflation expectations? That's the second issue on which research must be done. The third issue on which further research is required is an inappropriate inflation rate. We've chosen the 4% inflation as the target rate, presumably because it's believed to be the neutral rate of inflation. I recall RBI research, which shows that if inflation goes above 4%, the impact of the positive impact of low inflation on growth stops varying. And if inflation goes beyond 6%, is positively corrosive for growth, it's decidedly corrosive for growth. We in India benchmark our inflation to global inflation. Globally, inflation has died after the global financial crisis. Advanced economies, as we know, are finding it difficult to ignite inflation because of structural factors, secular stagnation, demographic decline, or technology progress. So the question that must be researched on is, is 4% inflation target still appropriate given that global inflation is subdued? The last item on which further research is required is the management of the impossible trinity. The impossible trinity says that an economy cannot at the same time maintain an open capital account have independent monetary policy, and have a fixed exchange rate. The question is this, does the inflation targeting framework allow the Reserve Bank of India the freedom and flexibility to manage impossible trinity? This is not just a theoretical question. It's a very practical issue. Back in July 2013, when I was the governor, we had taper tantrums and massive capital outflows. At that time, we used MSF, the Marginal Standing Facility Rate, an interest rate instrument 
to stem capital outflows, that is for the purpose of managing capital flows. If a situation like that were to emerge today, does the inflation targeting framework allow the Reserve Bank of India the freedom and flexibility to manage capital flows? Now I'll move on to the third issue on my list, which is fiscal consolidation. Dr. Acharya strongly recommends that the government needs to do urgent fiscal consolidation. So do I, so does everyone else. Fiscal consolidation is part of an apple pie. Everyone agrees with that, but how difficult it is to accomplish that is not usually recognized. The issue of fiscal consolidation has come center stage in this crisis. The government's Atmanirbhar package has just about 1.8 percentage points of additional spending, 1.8 percentage points of GDP of additional spending. Many economists have faulted the government for its fiscal restraint, for its fiscal rectitude, saying that this is not the time for fiscal rectitude. The government must borrow and spend more in order to engineer economic recovery. But would the markets penalize the government? No, say the commentators. If the government comes out with a clear and credible fiscal consolidation plan, virtually everyone stops there, just defining the problem and exhorting the government get to, to get onto a path of fiscal virtue without acknowledging the challenge of drawing up a clear and credible fiscal consolidation plan. I want to use the platform of this book release to define some of those challenges. Our debt GDP ratio as we entered this crisis was 70%. A paper prepared by Prachi Mishra presented at a conference a couple of weeks ago says that the debt GDP ratio because of the huge borrowing this year will go up to about 85%. And even if the crisis is behind us, even if there is some fiscal restraint moving forward, the debt to GDP ratio will continue to go up, climb up to beyond 90% by 2023. And after that, even under opt optimistic projections, will decline only to about 85% by 2025 in the medium term. So, Others might come out with different numbers, but I expect they'll be in the same ballpark range. Now consider this. The FRBM Review Committee says that, or said that, the debt to GDP ratio should be 60% for India to be on a sustainable growth path. World Bank research says that if the debt to GDP ratio exceeds 60%, for every percentage point of debt to GDP in excess of 60%, an emerging economy will lose 0 0.02 percentage points of growth every year. That might look like it is small, but cumulatively it can, can be enormous loss of welfare. So the challenge of drawing up a clear and credible fiscal consolidation plan translates to a clear and credible plan for reducing the debt to GDP ratio from around 90 to 85% to 60%. How do we do that? We have to raise growth rate. We have to cut down on productive expenditure. We have to improve tax efficiency. Most analysts say that. That's not a solution. That's just a redefinition of the problem. So I want to urge analysts and economists, get your hands dirty. Dive into the numbers. All of them are in the public domain. Don't just say accelerate the growth rate. Say how it can be done, even as the government has to be fiscally responsible, cannot borrow too much as it is doing this year. Don't just say improve tax efficiency. Say how and where it can be done. Don't just say prune on productive expenditures. Show where it can be done and show how it can be done. In his book, Dr. Acharya lays out a blueprint or urges the technocracy and the bureaucracy in the government 
to draw up a blueprint for an entire economic action plan, including fiscal consolidation. If the analyst world actually comes out with a clear and credible fiscal consolidation plan, it will provide a valuable platform for discussing how this can be done. So that concludes my three points. I've spoken about direct monetization of the deficit, where I agree with Dr. Acharya. I've spoken about inflation targeting framework, where I stopped short of an unqualified endorsement of it. And third, I've spoken about the urgent need for fiscal consolidation and the need for the analyst world to come out with a clear and credible plan. In conclusion, let me say that Dr. Viral Acharya served the government and the Reserve Bank of India and the country with dignity and distinction. He will certainly go down in the history of RBI as one of its influential deputy governors. He made a difference. I wish him and the book every success. Finally, I want to give some unsolicited advice to say his publications. You captured a great writer, a great thinker, a great author. Don't let go of him. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, former Governor Dr. Subara, for these uh, excellent remarks. Uh, thank you first for uh, all your kind words and the endorsement of the book. Uh, but even more than that, uh, what I take home from your remarks is uh, the need for a constructive debate uh, with details on how we can lay out a fiscal uh, path uh, that allows the necessary expenditures to be undertaken while simultaneously gives a medium term credibility and commitment uh, to markets and investors. Um, I also want to uh, reiterate uh, Dr. Subarao's theme on inflation targeting. Uh, and uh, if I could uh, point out that uh, throughout my term, uh, while I was writing the minutes, uh, one of the themes that I always uh, struggled with or tried to grapple with was how should external and financial stability be married into what otherwise looks just like an inflation with a cons inflation targeting with consideration for growth? Uh, this is still an evolving area of research and thinking uh, in finance and economics. Uh, one of the emerging threads which shows the most promise that uh, I embraced in my minutes was that the potential output of a country is not a fixed number. Uh, it is a number that is contingent on the external and the financial sector stability of, uh, of an open uh, economy such as India. Uh, I would urge uh, the audience, the researchers who undertake uh, the review or provide inputs into the review of inflation targeting that uh, Governor Subara is suggesting, uh, to potentially consider this factor, uh, which is, can we continue to assume that potential output growth rate is seven and a half percent, regardless of what measures are being undertaken, uh, for instance, uh, to ensure healthy capitalization of the financial sector and its ability to lend, or is financial sector stability an unstated prerequisite or initial condition for the assumption of a potential output uh, uh, growth rate of being seven and a half percent. Let me stop there. Uh, I now want to uh, first uh, once again uh, thank you so much uh, to both Dr. Reddy and Dr. Subarao for their insightful remarks and observations. Uh, I now want to hand over to the next uh, 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 panel. Uh, this is going to be chaired by Dr. Tamil Bandopadhyay, who is a consulting editor uh, at uh, Business Standard and a senior advisor to Jenner Small Finance Bank. As you know, Tamil has written extensively covering the economic history of uh, the Indian banking sector. Uh, he's going to speak to two of our leading uh, economists, uh, uh, Dr. Sajid Chinoy, uh, who's from JP Morgan. He's the chief India economist at JP Morgan, and Dr. Prachi Mishra, 
who is uh, managing director and chief India economist at Goldman Sachs India Securities and with whom I overlapped uh, briefly uh, at uh, the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, joining the panel will also be Dr. Subha Rao. Uh, so Tamil, uh, please also uh, uh, direct your questions to Dr. Subha Rao. Uh, and of course, I'm also available to answer any questions if you want to grill me uh, as well. Uh, over to you, Tamil. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. Very good evening. Uh, talking after two central bankers, three central bankers. And um, uh, one small little correction is this. I am not a doctor. I, I think you are, uh, everybody is a doctor here. So, Dr. Acharya made that mistake. <laughs> okay, I'm an observer of banking industry and central bank. Uh, so, what, uh, what the rules of the game is this? I'll, I'll speak a few minutes. Uh, as an introduction kind of thing and maybe then Shajid and Prachi will speak a few minutes, little more than me and then three of us plus two of you uh, Dr. Subarao and Dr. Acharya as well, five of us among us have little conversation uh, driven my week. Uh, well, uh, sometime I think last week of January 2017 uh, Reserve Bank of India got Viral Acharya as its newest Deputy Governor we who follow the uh, central banks uh, um, visit there and we started getting all kind of hearing all kind of stories that here is a gentleman who comes uh, sweating in the morning from bombay gym uh, playing tennis and goes straight to the um, bathroom and get a shower and then come to office uh, here is a gentleman who does not live in a deputy governor's uh, um, quarters in the Tony Nepiansi Road, and but comes from uh, distant uh, Western Sava Bile Parle. Uh, here is a gentleman who does not believe in wearing ties and formal clothes, uh, always in semi formal. So, in many ways, um, uh, Viral Acharya brought a sort of, if I say, glass nose in the uh, in Central Bank building. And then when he started talking, um, where is FIMDA or, or many other places, I think he was extremely candid, so much of candidness, which at times the market participants could not take it. So I would say that he was the first central banker in India who was showing his tough love uh, to the markets. And one of the speeches I remember in FIBDA, he was actually coming out with his all his graphs and all how to manage risk and all the technicalities between HTM and AFS and telling why should Reserve Bank of India take responsibility of your lousy risk management and, you know, change the uh, fine tune all your portfolios so that you can make money or you don't lose money. So that's that's Viral Acharya. Uh, and then um, uh, he left before his term ended. And then we come out just exactly after a year he left, we got this book. And this book actually, when I was going through it, um, it, it sort of, he took off from where he ended. Uh, at the first glance, when I, when I saw the title, it's talk, talking about the you know, fiscal dominance and all. I thought, uh, what's so great deal about it? I mean, that's, that's the uh, global phenomenon. Everywhere, every, even developed countries, we are seeing fiscal dominance, central banking is being to some extent curbed. So what's, what's so great deal? Why is he uh, making it a talking point? But when I went through this, I found it, it's, it's a completely different what I thought. I mean, he is, uh, as, is a very, uh, is like a graphic artist. He has given everything uh, uh, some of the things we knew some of the things we we we, we did not know uh, but the overall in in such a way he has done it it's it's an artistry as this is a graphic artist and where i find is uh, looking at a central bank in a completely different angle i mean i thought to 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 borrow to steal a old ad, ad, ad line of tata steel uh, which used to say that we also make uh, steel so here we also make we also do central banking because what are the other things we do here is a central bank because of the compulsions of the fisc it did everything possible to do to ensure that the government borrowing is is done and the right way and the right pricing uh, and to do that that influences the liquidity management system as well as the monetary policy decisions it also says that not only takes care of the government balance sheet it also has to take care of the 
bank balance sheets so that the public sector banks because if they make losses the government is not in a position to recapitalize them so it's rbi's responsibility to make sure uh, to tweaking the rules even media so that these banks are are not inconvenience they are uh, they are uh, they are you know they are not making as much losses as they would have done uh, so each i mean i i would not like to get into all the minor details and all but the 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 but the book as i said i mean uh, it it's not theory um, many of uh, many people can feel that um, you know he is an academician uh, but i don't see this he has uh, he has seen indian central banking through the prism of an academician i think i see is a very pragmatic central banker uh, whose academic background is a strength not a weakness uh, and uh, everything uh, he has done uh, you know ball by ball uh, uh, ball by he, he he has explained things what reserve bank of india does and how things can change uh, right from uh, and even the minutest details we did not know best of uh, uh, indian corporations uh, they do default uh, uh, they uh, they don't pay their money on time and we don't reveal that he say and uh, the book says that we don't reveal that by because the moment you default your credit rating goes down and the banks need to apportion a higher risk management so the bank needs to have uh, higher capital which the government cannot afford to so reserve bank of india looks the other way uh, so these are the things i think i think it's it's a wonderful book uh, and we will get into all the details uh, after saji sajid and prachi talk uh five of us will get into some of the micro things which i had in mind uh, ask each of you uh, here i end um, uh, and let's let's have a little bit of gender bias prachi first and then sajid yeah prachi hi hi everyone uh, am i audible yes uh, thank you very much uh, tamil good evening or uh, good morning to uh, everyone uh, on the other other part of the world Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to begin by uh, congratulating uh, Professor Vir- Virala Charya on the book. Uh, Tamil actually said that the book is not academic. I actually think that um, the book makes a very important contribution to the ac- academic literature across the macroeconomic and finance streams. And let me elaborate a bit how. Um, so if you look, you know, if you look at the standard macroeconomic textbook model, you know the models which we studied in grad school. fiscal dominance is defined as a situation where growing government debt to gdp constrains the conduct of monetary policy inducing the central bank to pay increasing attention to reducing the costs of servicing public debt in fact uh, if you uh, the distinction between monetary and fiscal dominance goes back to the seminal work by uh, sargent and wallace in 1990 so basically the idea is that you know if the government adjusts its uh, primary deficit to limit debt accumulation then the central bank is not forced to inflate away the debt allowing the central bank to focus on inflation in line with monetary dominance i think a huge contribution of virals book is actually to broaden the definition of fiscal dominance beyond its effects on monetary policies and to include the effect on financial regulations more broadly and this i think is, is especially important for a full service central bank of a large emerging market like india i think viral is perhaps very humble about the contribution of the book to the literature and this is what i would like to you know begin by emphasizing so the essence of the book are the mechanisms through which fiscal dominance can affect financial stability and vera lays out very nicely six such mechanisms and let me very briefly uh, for the audience reiterate and summarize them first he argues that look since timely recognition of loan losses by banks would require additional capital for the banks and that would have fiscal consequences therefore the government typically gets in discussion with the central bank on providing regulatory forbearance to banks the second mechanism is actually very interesting and i would not have thought about it naturally and it's quite shocking this is through default disclosure norms he argues that you know timely default information to markets would lead to credit rating downgrades and uh, therefore would again require more capital for banks 
and need to increase uh, budgetary allocation, which the government is obviously concerned about and therefore timely default information to market. Third, uh, the third mechanism is through monetary policy, but not in the standard way that I just talked about the Sargent and Wallace kind of argument. It's through treasury gains on bank balance sheets. So lower interest rates and expectations of lower interest rates actually leads to treasury gains on bank balance sheets and reduces the need for bank recapitalization. Hence, also creates a bias towards uh, lower inflation forecasts. The fourth mechanism is through asymmetric mark-to-market regulations. That is to reduce budgetary allocation of capital to public sector banks, but the mark-to-market accounting treatment is actually nudged. And treasury gains are transferred immediately as bond prices rally, but treasury losses are recognized over several quarters. The fifth mechanism is more you know, macroeconomic mechanism, though not the standard one, which is through relaxation of capital flow measures. So if you look at balance sheets in India, for example, for the, of, of government, corporates, and households, the private sector actually runs a significant surplus, but the government, in contrast, is, 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 is quite a guzzler. And Viral argues that you know, trying to convince the central bank to relax capital flow measures is another mechanism of fiscal dominance. And finally, the sixth mechanism is through central bank balance sheets, through asking central bank to pay higher dividends, and this has indeed been a bone of contention, and everyone is aware of that. So let me say that, you know, I'm sure that the six mechanisms which Bira lays out are actually informed by his own experience at the central bank and his interactions with the government. As an outsider, I think one question which comes uh, to mind and which I would like to raise as a puzzle relates to the government's reluctance to recapitalize public sector banks, which is at the heart of at least four arguments which Bira makes in the book. My understanding is that you know, the way uh, the Indian government recapitalizes banks, at least since 2019, is actually through issuing these recapitalization bonds, which are purchased by the banks, and basically the government uses these funds to infuse this equi infuse equity back into the public sector banks. There's actually no cash outgo from the budget, and it it does add to gross public debt, and more important, uh, more importantly, to interest costs of the government. But so far, you know, if you look at the data, interest costs from bank recapitalization have been, you know, pretty limited. And it, it can also be netted out against dividends paid by banks on the equity holdings of the government. So if you look at, you know, just to give you the numbers, if you look at all the recap bonds issued since uh, uh, January 2018, the average interest cost per year is like 30,000 crores. And this batch of uh, recap bonds has been 3 lakh crores. This is tiny compared to you know, the overall interest cost of the government. You know, budgeted interest cost for central government for FY21 alone is 7 lakh crores. Bottom line, you know, I've always wondered why the government does not want to, want to do more of recapitalization, given that number one, there's, no, there's not really big implication for the budget, at least in the short run. And as Viral argues in the book, the horizon of the government is more short run compared to the central bank. And number two, we all know that the need for PSB recapitalization is huge. Uh, therefore, you know, just uh, the reluctance of the government to recapitalize bank, public sector banks, which is at the heart of you know, most of the mechanisms through which fiscal dominance can affect financial stability, is a bit of a puzzle to me. With this, let me shift gears a bit and try to relate you know, some of the insights in Viral's book to the current situation. I think we, everyone would agree that Look, the loss of output from the COVID crisis in India has been at least of the order of magnitude of 20 lakh crores or 10% of GDP, and many people think it's way higher. Across the world, you know, in advanced or and emerging economies, we've seen the first round losses from the crisis have been compensated, varying from partial to even, you know, fuller degree by discretionary fiscal policy support, so that the second round effects of the pandemic are minimized. For India, as you know, uh, Dr. Subarao mentioned in his lecture as well, that most estimates would suggest that discretionary fiscal policy support has been rather tepid and in the range of 1% to 2% of GDP. At the face of it, you could argue that, look, if there were fiscal dominance, you would see way higher discretionary fiscal policy support. And the central bank would directly buy government, government debt, as, for example, Indonesia has done. I think, I, I think Dr. Subarao also referred to to this, this issue in his, uh, in, in, in his talk. The fact is that, you know, even with 1% to 2% GDP discretionary spending, Indian sovereign as a whole is actually tracking a fiscal deficit of 15% of GDP. 
And of course, that's a function of the initial conditions on which India went into the crisis. And so who is buying this government debt? Actually, the central bank is already buying a significant chunk. So if you look at the first four months of the fiscal year, about 30% of the issuances of dated securities is being bought by the central bank. 70% is by banks, but 60 to 70% of that is by public sector banks. So therefore, between the central bank itself and the government-owned banks, the government system is monetizing about 70 to 80% of the debt already. And even if the central bank is not buying, it is managing the government borrowing program, as Viral points out in the book. And in fact, as most market participants would agree, um, has managed it quite smoothly during the crisis. So this is clearly fiscal dominance, even though it, it, it's not directly monetizing the debt. And therefore, I think insights from Viral's book apply clearly to the current crisis as well. So why, you know, why haven't we seen more aggressive fiscal support? I think no one would disagree that you know, more fiscal support is needed given the nature and scale of the shock. The point is that, and I think Vira lays this out clearly in the book, is that fiscal dominance during normal times has basically allowed the sovereign to run an order of magnitude of deficits of like 10% or so. And this implies that the government's ability to counter cyclical fiscal policy during crisis times like these is severely curtailed. And I think the economy has to pay a huge price of this. In, our own, in my own research, you know, we estimate fiscal impulse at close to zero. And in fact, my understanding is that the line ministries are getting directions from the government to not even spend what's been budgeted. And if that's true, we are really talking about fiscal policy being a drag on growth than even having a neutral impulse on growth. Let me conclude uh, by talking uh, you know, a bit about the FRBM. I think Viral refers to the FRBM a number of times in the book. Both Sajid and I worked for the FRBM Review Committee. Basically, we made a case for an appropriate ceiling of debt to GDP ratio uh, for India of 60% for the Indian sovereign center and states combined and a fiscal deficit of 5% of GDP to be reached by FY23. It is obvious that the targets have been breached, but not even that. Even escape clause has been violated both inside and outside the budget for several reasons. You know, GST was a huge structural reform which presented implementation challenges and led to sharp slowdown in revenues, which were unanticipated, slowdown in the economy for domestic and global reasons and magnified by the NBFC crisis, higher infrastructure spending, which this government has done, or for procuring food, food grains, um, where you know, a lot of this infrastructure spending and the food, uh, you know, procurement spending occurred through off budget entities. Now, interestingly, there are discussions ongoing to bring changes in the FRBM framework itself. And basically, two reasons have been given for this. Number one is the COVID crisis. And number two is that, look, now real interest rates are negative. So why worry about debt? I will just conclude by making three arguments. I think first, I think just to remind everyone, and I think uh, Viral has also made this point in the book, that actually, you know, deviations from the FRBM happened even before the COVID crisis. And the crisis has just ex accentuated these trends. Second, you know, now real interest rates have turned negative. But if you look at any economic model, negative real interest rates is not an equilibrium. And even if we look at Indian data over the last 20 years, a maximum one third of the months you've had negative real rates. I think my view is that one should not get carried away with short term developments in coming up with an, you know, an appropriate medium, medium term framework for the country. And third, I think none of the arguments, if you read the FRBM Review Committee report, none of the arguments for 60% of GDP optimal debt or for 5% fiscal deficit actually rely on short term cyclical fluctuations in the economy. I mean, the arguments are all long term arguments based on economic fundamentals like long term savings and investment rates, relationship between debt and growth, long term equilibrium interest rates consistent with economic fundamentals, etc. So the bottom line, I think, is, you know, one could make the argument that, look, it would take India X more years than we initially thought to achieve these long term goals due to X, Y, Z reasons, you know, shocks beyond our controls, structural reforms like GST. And of course, there need, needs to be accountability to the parliament and clear reasons for deviations. But you can't keep changing the goalposts every two to three years. You know, the, uh, the FRBM review committee was, report was accepted by the parliament hardly two years ago. You know, then it becomes very easy. As economic conditions change, change the goalpost itself. Inflation is going up, change the inflation goalpost. Revenues are going down, change the fiscal deficit goal. So of course, you know, that said, I think in the short term, the economy has to pay a price. 
and the price of not saving and investing in an umbrella when, the, when there's sun and shine is you have to bear the cost when it's raining. And I think this is one of the underlying implications of fiscal, fiscal dominance. And that is really the essence of Viral's book. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Brachi. Let's hear Sajid and then we'll get into a little bit of conversation among us. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Damal. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to join everybody else to congratulate Dr. Vilacharya on, a, on, a, on an excellent uh, uh, contribution. And I want to just echo what Prachi said, that this is, I think, a very important uh, addition uh, to the academic literature on the subject. I think what makes this book particularly readable are two facets. One is Viral is so seamlessly able to you know, combine theoretical first principles uh, to market microstructure uh, to policy prudence. So I think it's going to have wide ranging appeal from, as, as Governor uh, said before, from students to academics to practitioners. The second is, I think, what's special is Viral is able to demonstrate just how inextricably the financial sector, fiscal, regulatory, and the external sectors are linked. I think that's the key contribution that it takes a very general equilibrium framework to show how inextricably these, uh, these sectors are linked and provides a unifying framework to explain their recent evolution. Now, what are the three lead motifs that came out of this book for me? And let me talk a couple of minutes on that and then talk about their current relevance. The first, of course, uh, as has been said, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, um, uh, repeatedly, has been this issue of fiscal dominance. And Viral is able to show that the impact of that dominance, um, you know, on emerging markets more generally, on India in particular, is broader than one thinks. It's not just about uh, impeding monetary policy transmission. It's really about allocative efficiency. It's even about financial stability. Uh, so I won't spend much time on that since Prachi and, and, uh, and, and Governor Subhadrav have gone into that. Let me sit, spend some uh, time on the second leitmotif, which really is the financial sector, which Viral speaks with, with great passion and purpose. And I think for me, the key takeaway from the book was uh, that financial sector interventions to be effective have to be holistic. You have to combine the recognition of stressed assets with a resolution mechanism, and you have to combine that with a recapitalization framework. If any part of that chain breaks down, then the efficacy of what was achieved is greatly undermined. So my main takeaway was that really it's the holistic nature of the intervention from start to finish uh, that makes it efficacious. And you know, if you have to boil uh, this book down into three words, I'll take the liberty of interpreting it as I do. It's basically capital, capital, capital. And repeatedly through the book, uh, Dr. Acharya is talking about the need to preemptively and aggressively uh, recapitalize banks, both public sector and private sector. And I think he shows very convincingly that the that when you have an undercapitalized bank, uh, there are lots of uh, you know unseen allocative efficiency impacts. Uh, we see that there is uh, you know evergreening of loans. Uh, you're propping up zombie firms, uh, and that hurts efficiency of credit. But what we don't realize, and Dr. Acharya points out, is on the borrower side, by keeping excess capacities, you're really hurting the pricing power of the more healthy, profitable firms, and therefore impeding their profitability and their future investment. So the distortions are really manifold when you don't have an adequately capitalized uh, a banking system. So for me, really, the key point about the financial sector really was the holistic nature of the intervention. We have to think through the recognition, the resolution, and the recapitalization, and always be ahead of the curve uh, on capital. Now, the third lead motif that came out to me, which has not been discussed so much this far, is this complementarity uh, between building up FX reserves by the central bank and yet having some capital flow management. This is a very subtle point here because most you know, uh, onlookers would say, well, these are really substitutes. If I have enough FX reserves, I can take the liberty of opening up my capital account. And this is a particularly important uh, point in time today because you've got central banks around the world opening their taps and you're seeing you know, capital gushing towards emerging markets. And in a very clever economic framework, Dr. Acharya and his co-author actually point out that these are really not uh, uh, substitutes, they complement. Because once a central bank does build up a war chest of reserves, kind of a moral hazard creeps in, and you may have elements of the private sector that undo that build up by themselves taking on short-term debt. And therefore, there really is a role for capital flow management 
without which you are confronted constantly with the trilemma. So I think, you know, as I've demonstrated uh, on all these topics on, on fiscal, uh, on the financial sector, on the external sector, this is a wide ranging book uh, that offers a lot of insight. Um, let me just talk a couple of minutes about why it's relevant today. The great irony here is the book, the very first paragraph of the book is uh, 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 the experience of Dr. Acharya when he's leaving NYU Stern to come to India and he's making, interestingly, a list of priorities at Newark Airport. And the first priority really is on the large buildup in non-performing assets. And he's thinking about, you know, how should we tackle this? Now, fast forward, uh, you know, almost five years. And ironically, because of COVID, we're in that exact same situation today, where just recently uh, the RBI's financial stability report pointed out that based on different risk scenarios, NPAs and the banking system will, you know, go between 12 and 14 percent of advances. So at some level, um, you know, history is repeating itself to where Dr. Acharya was, uh, you know, in 2017. And that's why the book is particularly relevant and particularly topical because you, that same set of issues that had to be encountered in the last four years, recognition, resolution, recapitalization, will also be great policy challenges going forward. Now, you know, in the midst of the fog of COVID, there are a number of trade-offs the economy is going to uh, confront. Uh, one is how do you provide sufficient fiscal support uh, in the in the midst of the crisis? Prachi spoke about a you know very small fiscal impulse. How do you provide enough fiscal support to hold the economy together and yet institutionalize a medium-term consolidation plan to convince investors and ratings agencies and markets? That's one trade-off. The second trade-off is how do you keep economically viable firms alive through COVID? and they do that in a manner without hurting financial sector balance sheets. The third trade-off is how do you enable the creative destruction that's inevitable from COVID and yet do so in a manner that's non-disruptive and doesn't hurt potential growth. The fourth trade-off is at a time where, you know, uh, the G3 central banks are literally doubling their balance sheets. You're going to have this tsunami of capital coming to emerging markets. How do you remain discriminatory about what capital to, uh, to accept and what not to, and yet uh, you know, not fall a victim of the Dutch disease? These are pressing, uh, important questions with no easy answers. And that's why I think the book is particularly topical, because it helps you understand what some of these trade-offs will mean, and it provides a framework to mitigate some of these risks. Let me end by just um, taking on um, Dr. Governor Subarao's challenge to economists and to analysts to say, don't just restate the problem, you know, uh, tell us how to solve it. So let me take one crack at that and relate it to uh, Dr. Acharya's book. You know, all of us worry about debt sustainability. I think now it's commonplace that we will be at 85 or close to 85 percent of GDP by the end of COVID year. And really, there are you know three variables that will drive debt sustainability in the medium term. One, of course, is you know the fiscal consolidation path itself. Uh, the second is going to be what is the difference between nominal GDP growth and borrowing costs. And the third itself is going to be well, you know, how will potential growth and medium term growth evolve? And I think the first challenge for economists is to understand. Uh, which of these what should one prioritize? You know, how, how sensitive are medium-term debt dynamics to these variables? And here, let me offer a small thought experiment. I think it's clear that where medium-term growth ends up, where potential growth ends up, is by far the most important determinant of debt dynamics. And I'll give you a small example. For the sake of argument, let's assume two scenarios, one in which medium-term nominal GDP growth is about 8%. Uh, and therefore, real GDP growth is imputed to be about 5%. And the second scenario where medium term real growth is about 7 and therefore nominal GDP growth is 10%. What I want to point out the small changes in medium term growth, the difference between 8% in the first scenario and 10 in the second, have huge ramifications for debt sustainability. In the first scenario, uh, you know, when nominal GDP is 8%, no matter how little or how much fiscal support you provide, debt to GDP keeps rising monotonically towards 90%, which raises question marks on sustainability. In the second scenario, where you have a little higher growth, debt to GDP goes up for a couple of years and then begins to come down. So I think we cannot emphasize enough 
how small changes in medium term growth have huge impacts on India's fiscal and debt sustainability. And the way to relate this to Dr. Acharya's book is, I think it's widely understood that in the medium term, financial stability is a prerequisite to medium term growth. So by focusing on financial stability, you're actually boosting medium, medium term growth and therefore helping debt sustainability. And I, therefore, and, and I want to end by saying there is this you know, unappreciated complementarity between the fiscal and the financial stability because in the medium term, they're both complementing each other. But let me end by again congratulating Dr. Acharya on the book, on a very readable book. I strongly recommend this to students, to practitioners, uh, to academics and look forward to the Q&A section. Tamil, back to you. Thanks, Ajit. Thanks, Ajit. I think there is a bit of a logistic issue about the timing. We are running a little ahead, I mean, you know, out of time. So with your permission, what I'm planning to do, unless we get a green signal that we can exceed the time in any way, uh, since Dr. Acharya is the main, uh, you know, his book and he has not spoken anything uh, except for his dedication um, and, and the proceeds going to Pratham, uh, he has not spoken anything. So rather, I would prefer him to have a, uh, to highlight a few things. Uh, and then if the time permit, him, we'll get into others. So is that okay, Dr. Acharya? Uh, uh, I sure, Tamal. Yeah. Uh, I thought, yeah. I, I think it's great going. I thought the yeah. interventions no, by thought, all of you were uh, terrific, I think. Uh, because because yes, we have yes. to, we have to take audience questions and all. So I am, yes, yes. Uh, because Dr. Subara has spoken and all, all two of them have spoken. I, I did not interrupt. So rather, I think it's your turn to have a few things to say. And I'll get into uh, little, a few micro issues. I don't have too many um, in your way. So one is this, uh, you re emphasized on reprivatization of some of the public sector banks. Uh, you know, and I have seen on the tweets on social media that your book, you have not, you are pretty silent about the private banks. They are also not necessarily well governed, all of them. And when you talk about consolidation and that's the kind of, on the one hand, we are seeing uh, privatization by stealth public sector banks, uh, they are losing their market share. On the other hand, government is focusing on consolidation from 21, it has come down to, I think, 11 banks, but still it's a government holding. Uh, and you spoke about reprivatization. So can you tell us uh, what was the, what prompted you to say this? Uh, uh, thank you, Tamil. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. First of all, I think these were uh, really terrific, thought-provoking uh, interventions. Um, uh, I, I think my, my view, Tamil, is that all options need to be on the table. Uh, I think uh, if you read Dr. Reddy's forward, he, he mentions that even Narsimhan Committee, which was long back, you know, it's not near, really about, it, it is before all these legacy NPA problems became a big deal uh, after in the last decade, that Narsimhan Committee had actually said that the government stakes in public sector banks should be brought down to 30%. Uh, that there should be synergistic uh, mergers uh, designed between banks where there's complementarity, let's say, in, in modern terms between like what IT they're using, something as simple as that, for example, uh, or where, you know, uh, there is geographic overlap. So there is room for branch consolidation and reducing your overhead costs. Uh, and third, that the dual control. Uh, between the government and the RBI of the public sector banks needs to be done away with. Uh, so I think these were these are actually issues that were flagged even before uh, the most recent wave of non-performing assets uh, have been have been recognized. Uh, so in my opinion, the divestments are a first step. Divestments beyond majority stake because they will help relax the fiscal constraint. Uh, perhaps reprivatization of some of the healthiest public sector banks, relatively healthier public sector banks should also be on the table. And let me explain to you where I'm coming at this from. Uh, I had done a study on the uh, Southeast Asian crisis when a large number of banks, uh, public sector banks in these Southeast Asian countries had to be privatized in the midst of an external and financial crisis in these countries in 97, 98. Uh, these banks had to be sold at fire sale prices. Uh, in many cases, they were actually sold to private equity investors from abroad because that was the only money coming in willing to buy these banks. Uh, 
uh, I'm visualizing that we should not end up in this scenario. In my view, it would be better to actually divest these stakes in a graceful manner at right prices. And the right prices will be attractive uh, from a variety of constraints only for the relatively healthier uh, public sector banks, in my view. There will be benefits, uh, in my view. There will not just be the relaxation of the fiscal constraint. I think they will bring with them uh, modern technology, fintech capacity, credit scoring, modern credit scoring capacity, risk management capacity, and the ability to attract human capital with uh, sort of, you know, uh, the right incentive compensation structures. Uh, I think the last point that is raised is important. I'm, uh, I would not say at all that there will not be failures of governance in the private sector banks. In fact, uh, the question is right. There have been failures of governance in the private sector banks. Uh, but I think one should separate what is a systemic problem in a part of the banking sector, uh, notably in the public sector banking, which has been inefficient with very low return on assets, very low return on taxpayer money for a long period of time, with what are idiosyncratic uh, issues in a few banks uh, in the private uh, sector banking. Uh, and second, uh, my thesis has also been that the regulation of the financial sector as a whole, including of private sector banks, has had a race to the bottom because of having to accommodate uh, the public sector banking related constraints. In fact, I, I say this explicitly in the introductory chapter that because the Reserve Bank of India does not distinguish in its rules between public sector banks and private sector banks, uh, other than what the law requires, uh, it is forced to actually adopt uh, weaker standards for the system as a whole. And I think if we reduce the stakes of the government in the banking sector, uh, besides the backdoor uh, privatization that was mentioned, uh, I think we will actually lift the quality of regulation for the system as a whole. Uh, Tamil, if I may, I wanted to yeah. just respond sure. to uh, pra Prachi's uh, sure. uh, question and puzzle, which I think is a very important one, which is why is it that even though you can recapitalize with very tiny addition uh, to the immediate expense in the form of these recap bonds, uh, why do we not simply just go ahead and undertake uh, the intervention? Uh, and I think uh, I, I think it's a great question because, in my view, that is how tight the fiscal constraint is. That even a tiny interest burden to be added as a bill from the financial sector recap becomes actually a very difficult item to add uh, to the balance sheet. I think it is that tight, in my view, the fiscal. Uh, second, a very pragmatic uh, view, if I could offer, which is that there are various ministries, and they are all basically gunning for funds uh, at the time of the budget allocation. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Department of Economic Affairs is trying to accommodate all of them. Uh, if they can push a lot of this burden onto the Reserve Bank of India by basically reducing a part of the component, you know, reduce the interest costs for debt rollovers, uh, reduce the recap bill, then it frees up a little bit of budget uh, for all of them. And so I think uh, the Reserve Bank of India and, you know, you can almost see they all uh, it's almost like a synchronized uh, play that happens at that time. Everyone actually starts looking at the Reserve Bank of India for accommodation collectively uh, from the other side. And that's because uh, they all get a little bit of freebie uh, on their uh, on their collective plate uh, if RBI could accommodate. And I think this is also a central theme. Uh, and third point, if I could mention, uh, uh, which is a bit tangential to Prachi's question, but I want to uh, relate it to one of Dr. Reddy's uh, quotes uh, from the forward. He refers to uh, the post 90s post 2000 uh, sorry pre 90s pre 2000 era uh, as being one in which the government the central bank and the public sector banks were like a hindu undivided family in which no one bothered to actually keep track of where the accounts are uh, my view is that when we start managing government bond yields uh, on a on a persistent basis uh, you basically create a Hindu undivided family situation, even with a bond market in presence, which is actually supposed to be sending signals of inflation or fiscal vulnerability. And what has happened is that because of this flavor of Hindu undivided family getting attached 
to the interactions of banks, the government and the central bank, even in the midst of a large bond market, is that we, we have allowed fiscal slippage to actually happen and be accommodated without actually seeing it being manifested in the debt markets as much as uh, one might have expected. So I think these issues are right at the core uh, of, of, of some of the points on fiscal stability uh, that we face right now. Over to you, Tamil. Yeah, thanks, Rajari. Uh, those uh, uh, who have not read the book or those, I mean, most of uh, the audience have not read the book. Uh, Dr. Acharya also mentioned not only reprivatization, he has also spoken, he has also uh, made a pitch for a larger play for foreign banks. Correct? You did say that. The foreign, uh, foreign entities, they should have a... Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm not as explicit, Tamil, uh, in the yeah. book on this, but I think in my interview with you, I was uh, far more explicit. Uh, okay. If I could just make one uh, minor sure. point here, which is that on the one hand, we, we want to say we want to create a level playing field. So these foreign banks should also be subject to uh, rules such as the priority sector norms and so on. Uh, I think the question we have to ask is, uh, are they really delivering at the end of the day? Can't we have a differentiated system uh, in which maybe we refocus uh, some of the smaller public sector banks to do exclusively the financial inclusion and development objective rather than the entire system sure. being forced to have priority sector rules? I think this way we would improve the return on capital that foreign banks see as what they can earn on in India. And that kind of differentiation of banking structures might be a better model than trying to do a brute force priority sector norms on everyone across board. There are many other issues, but there are two particular things I would ask you, Dr. Acharya, if you quickly, if you can give one answer. On one particular issue, we were completely different from the RBI status stance. That is the debt management. Now, RBI status stance, and Reddy Garu is here, uh, they all were resisting when uh, government of India wanted to take away uh, that responsibility from RBI. But in your book, you said actually there is a conflict of interest. You did not say this. I am putting it in my own words. Basically, once you are government's debt manager, you make everything to possible uh, to the smooth, smooth run, uh, which is not exactly um, you know what you should do. Uh, you are asking that uh, RBI should be relieved of this debt management. Isn't that? Uh, so I, I have mixed feelings uh, on this, Tamil. Uh, my sense is uh, former governors and deputy governors uh, who have uh, supported retaining the debt management also recognize the conflict of interest. Uh, my understanding is that they have concerns about uh, the conflict of interest of getting public sector banks and others buying the bonds may become even worse if RBI is actually not the debt manager, okay? Uh, I think uh, they think that uh, at least right now, the RBI can be somewhat at arm's length uh, in this function. Uh, but if you if it is run entirely in the government, maybe it will be hard to actually put a discipline on this. So I think there are different models here that are possible. And I think as long as we can ensure integrity of bond market prices, my sense is either model would be fine. You retain debt management with the RBI uh, and, you know, somehow you ensure that RBI focuses on placement of debt rather than on prices. Uh, I, I realize the two are interconnected, but I think uh, managing an auction is different from managing auction prices, in my view. Uh, you know, RBI has played a tremendous role in development of the debt market. Just think about the NDS home system. Just think about the role that CCIL is providing, etc. So I think these are infrastructure roles that RBI can play. And I think it will be important for the RBI to continue to play that role because I think that is where the capacity to perform these functions lies. Uh, I think the concern with uh, siphoning of the debt management to the government besides the conflict of interest issue is also one of expertise. Uh, as you know, right now, a lot of the staff that is presently with the government for debt management is actually posted from RBI. Uh, so, you know, they have to be able to attract the right staff from the market uh, to be able to do this job uh, in a good manner. So uh, I have mixed feelings on what is the right solution okay. here. And therefore, perhaps incrementally, we seem to be just going with uh, what has been the status quo. 
Dr. Subara, I, I don't know if Dr. Subara or Dr. Reddy would Subara. like to chime in. Here. Sir, uh, any of you want to say something on this? Dr. Reddy, Dr. Subara? Uh, I'll let Dr. Reddy go first. Yeah, yeah. Briefly, sta briefly stated, sir, when I joined as deputy uh, governor, uh, I wanted the separation. But as I observed, the risks of separation of debt management at this stage are more. Okay. So okay. if the fiscal fiscal deficit is brought to a reasonable level, so it's a question of timing, not the solution. Okay. What Achar Professor Achara says is the correct solution. How do you reach okay. it? That's all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Subara. Uh, uh, thank you, Tamal. I want to say that in my experience at the Reserve Bank, I have not seen any conflict between debt management and monetary policy. So if that is an argument for shifting debt management out of the RBI, at least my experience does not bear this out. Second, I believe there is an important reason why debt management should continue to be with the Reserve Bank, as Dr. Reddy said, until the fiscal deficit comes down. Because today, in the absence of a corporate bond market, the GSEC market, the yields on the G6 set the uh, signal for the entire interest rate structure in the economy, and managing that is important for financial stability. So until we have a corporate bond market, until the FISC comes under control, it's important that debt management be with the Reserve Bank. And the third thing I want to say is this. Having been finance secretary at the state level, having been finance secretary to government India, the governments are less sensitive to interest rate cost than is commonly believed. So, to believe okay. that the governments are okay. yeah. to believe that the governments are asked for interest rate, you know, saying that we're going to borrow less because interest rate is high, is not my experience. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, Shaji, do you want to say anything? Shaji, Prachi, anybody? One liner, anything you want to say on this? Debt management? That's fine, Damal. Uh, with yeah. two governors and a deputy governor having spoken, uh, I think that's th th those are the final words. <laughs> okay. Same here, Tamil, nothing to add from my, nothing okay. to add from my Okay. Um, um, uh, Dr. Acharya, one important thing you said, I mean, it's, it's a very classic yes. statement. I think Dr. Reddy started saying this, or even before Dr. Rangarajan Purul, but everybody, all of you said that, uh, that uh, regulation should be ownership neutral, right? You said that in reference to in reference to public sector banks, you said that. Now, I am referring to, even though it is not in your book, I mean, you said this in your book, recently in mid-June, Reserve Bank of India uh, has released a discussion paper on, on governance and board in, in banks in India. And there is a particular paragraph which says, uh, the, there is a various things they said about the power of the board and uh, CEO, what, what one can do, what cannot do, etc., etc. But there is a caveat that wherever there is applicable rule and ownership, those things will prevail. This is not, this, these new norms, as and when they're adopted, they will not be applicable uh, they, they, they will not supersede the existing norm, which means uh, the current norms of government managing the public sector banks directly and indirectly will continue. Uh, but you have said that it should be ownership neutral. So would you like to say a little more on that? Like when, we, when, we, when Reserve Bank of India uh, comes out with the new governance structure, actually they should take a relook at the entire thing? Uh Yes, Tamil. Uh, I think I am I'm 100% uh, in support of ownership uh, neutral regulation. Uh, this was a theme that was uh, sort of being pushed by the Reserve Bank of India, at least throughout the, my term there. Uh, and I think, as I was saying, this is something that even prior committees like Narsimhan committee have hinted uh, at something that should be done, uh, as Dr. Reddy mentions in the forward of his book. Uh, to me, the critical point is the political economy of why we got public sector banks in the first place. Uh, you know, there was no Department of Banking Supervision when the banks were first uh, nationalized, but then uh, Department of Banking was created and then it became Department of Financial Services. 
Uh, note that Department of Financial Services did not have an appointment uh, on the board of the RBI until very recently. So these are all sort of, uh, these, these have all been uh, creeping intrusions in my view uh, of getting the governance of the of a part of the banking sector away from the Reserve Bank of India uh, into the hands of the government. And I think it has deep implications. Just think about a prompt corrective action or think about RBI's ability to actually deal with um, um, uh, deal with, say, management uh, that is not working well uh, or is not working in the interests of the long term interests of the bank or the depositors. In case of private banks, the Reserve Bank has been able to actually take corrective steps and measures, uh, whereas the ability to take any such measures is severely limited. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India can possibly arrange uh, a sale uh, of a bank if financial stability is a concern, if it's a private bank, but such measures are explicitly prohibited since government is actually the owner of the public sector banks. Now, these are uh, almost fundamental to the resolution of weak banks, being able to replace management, being able to uh, replace equity owners with injections of new equity and transfer of ownership to better uh, potentially better owners are fundamental to uh, uh, reform and resolution of weak banks and this is simply not possible in the case of public sector banks given the given that you know the nationalized bank nationalization act overrides uh, some of the uh, some of the rbi act provisions on rbi's command over the banking sector Thanks, Dr. So these we these need just... to be these need to be sure. fundamentally looked at in my view. Uh, I would prefer if uh, the Department of Financial Services was just an equity manager, like a passive equity portfolio manager, uh, rather than an intrusive uh, banking quote unquote regulator, so to speak. <laughs> DFS, DF. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. But we have just exactly five minutes more. I would love to involve everybody, but we can't. So I have one uh, last question, Dr. Acharya. You give a quick answer and then maybe one, at least one question from the audience. Meanwhile, I'll ask everybody to keep your mic on mute. This is about the shadow banks in India. Uh, you said that, uh, and you said rightly so, we have decided we would not be the lender of the first, reso uh, first resort, we would be the lender of the last resort. Uh, referring to the crisis that you said, 2018, that blow up. Uh, but uh, there's a feeling that uh, we haven't handled the uh, uh, NBFC crisis uh, well. It could have been. So my question to you, and you have to give a very quick answer, then a couple of questions yes. probably from the audience. Till 7.10, we have three, four minutes left. That what, uh, are the NBFCs relevant? We believe it is relevant. Then what is the position they hold in the Indian financial system? Uh, I think NBFCs are very important. Uh, they do certain kinds of uh, asset and collateral based lending uh, that they have specialized in. Uh, uh, and, you know, they are able to uh, both underwrite and collect in segments of financial intermediation uh, that banks are often not there. Uh, so I, I prefer a differentiated uh, financial system where different business models, different balance sheet models are all at work. Uh, to come back to your uh, first point on uh, whether we have managed it well or not, uh, my view is that uh, parts of it require recapitalization uh, and that can only be assessed if an earnest stress test and asset quality review is undertaken. This review should be transparent and each NBFC based on the review and stress test should be told how much capital they need to raise in rupee terms. And if they don't raise it, uh, prompt corrective action, which exists in some form even for NBFCs uh, or whatever other rights uh, the Reserve Bank of India has can be deployed in order to transfer ownership to those who are willing to bring in the capital, in my view. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. We have three minutes. So you, you have the questions on your iPad, I guess. You can take a question. I just need a concluding remark for 30 seconds, we may. Uh, even though your uh, your book is a compilation of your old speeches and the new thing is only the introduction, your preface and, and epilogue and Dr. Reddy's intro, I think the speeches are as such, they can be, they should be read again and again. 
and why is this i am telling you first time when you when you when you 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 spoke at one particular for your first speech all of us are taken aback what is this uh, central bank are saying and many of us thought reminded us of uh, dr reddy's august 1997 goa speech where he said that basis rer rupee is overvalued and everybody thought that he was actually carelessly he spoke on that but actually it was very carefully crafted that's what dr reddy said and it was even cleared by then governor dr rangarajan and the next day the rupee started falling so he was sending a message in a very candid clear term and you also through all your speeches during your deputy governorship uh, uh, you did so so they should be read again and again and it's a great that it's now within two between two covers i end here you have just couple of minutes to take a question congratulations thank you uh, th thank you thank you tamil for uh, chairing and moderating the panel uh, I, i i just want to add that uh, in the last week i have read dr reddy's forward three times on my ipad mm -hmm. so i think the book is worth it <laughs> just for dr reddy's <laughs> masterful forward uh, i think it's a great historical summary of the issues that we face right now and why these are perennial issues rather than just issues we face right now uh, manisha is there a question uh, you want me to take uh, before we uh, wrap up the session yes uh, yes dr acharya there are uh, in fact a lot of questions but i, I think it's, we have seven there is a time set time so, so yeah so we'll just take a few questions so uh, let me just read out the one of the first questions um usha thorat madam uh, ma'am is asking why can't non merit subsidies be eliminated these have been clearly identified by a number of economists uh absolutely uh, thank you usha for this question i i uh, I've, i fully agree uh i would be in favor of uh more and more uh, capital expenditures being a part of the central budget uh actually even though on the consolidated budget we do about 20 to 25% capex spending most of it comes from the states the center budget is maybe 90% or more uh, just subsidies maybe another 3 4% defense and very bare minimum is left for infrastructure and so on uh, clearly if we want to attract some of the businesses from abroad to come in here uh, we need a more thriving uh, and high quality infrastructure and uh, doing away with some merit based subsidies maybe rolling them over into a simple single transfer uh, might be the way to go so that uh, you know then it's uh, the recipient who decides what to do with the subsidy rather than uh you know the government actually skewing various markets and prices and demands uh through linking the subsidies for specific usages i i, I would be fully on board with that great so uh, i guess we can take another question uh let me just read out a question from ms rajeshwari sen gupta from bombay uh so she says amidst a situation where corporate bankruptcies are likely to skyrocket and the economy can be still has been still recovering from repercussions of the failure of restructuring schemes of 2015 20, 2010 2015 era we have suspended the ibc for a year as a result there is no resolution framework in place for the deluge of npas about to hit the banks once the moratorium ends isn't this a pressing issue that needs to be urgently addressed if we keep diluting and postponing ibc the needs for recap will go up even more uh i i tend to agree with you rajeshwari uh, my view is that uh, we do need corporates to restructure their debts the whole idea of bankruptcy is not is not first and foremost to punish the owner it is to actually financially restructure a balance sheet whose debt looks too high relative to the equity generating and cash flow generating capacity so uh i think the ibc codes can be reopened as the economy reopens and a mechanism should be created uh, to uh, to allow this restructuring to take place that is the essence uh, of insolvency and bankruptcy code uh, uh, the real issue always in india on debt restructuring comes down to bank recognizing losses and recapitalizing 
uh, and therefore I've been fervently pushing uh, in, in all interactions with anyone to say that first and foremost, we need to recapitalize the banking system for the stress losses that have been identified in RBI's financial stability report. If the capital is there, there will be greater acceptance of debt restructuring, which will be required for corporates to be able to maintain staff, uh, maintain capital expenditures and continue with their business uh, as and when the recovery takes hold. Uh, Dr. Acharya, I think we are running yeah. out of time, so I don't think we should take any more questions, but I just want to thank the audience uh, for patiently listening and sending all the questions. And uh, I I would just uh, give it back to you, Dr. Acharya. You can uh, you know do the concluding remarks. Uh, yes, uh, once again, uh, I want to thank uh, all the participants, uh, including those who have left because we have overrun in terms of time. Uh, but uh, uh, mostly I want to thank Dr. Reddy, Dr. Subarav, uh, Tamil Bandopadhyay, Prachi Mishra, Sajid Chinoy, and the entire Sage India team uh, who have truly been terrific. Uh, in, in helping uh, get this book out. Uh, finally, uh, I, 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 there's a number of people I have thanked in the acknowledgements of the book. Uh, I don't have the time to go through each one of these, uh, but I must say that I need to repeat uh, the gratitude uh, that has been expressed uh, in those acknowledgements. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy reading the book. Uh, it is meant to stir a debate. Uh, I never believe uh, any one individual always has the right answers. But if we use public debate uh, exchanges and discussions to raise the right questions, uh, the system as a whole starts gravitating towards the right answers. And that is the spirit in which uh, this book has been written on fiscal dominance of financial stability. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I wish you and your families and loved ones uh, the very best of health and safety uh, in these challenging times. Uh, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Sage, a very, very warm thanks to everyone for joining in and for everyone who sent in their questions. Uh, thank you very much, and we hope you enjoy the event.